climate change is here. Whether we believe it or not, or we, whether we admit it or not, it is here. Because Bangladesh is the second largest delta, the brunt of the climate change will be most in Bangladesh. This is a, a picture of the aftermath of Isla, and here, uh, this is inundation by seawater. So it's not fresh water, mind you. I'm sure you guys remember after having a swim in the sea, how the salt gets everywhere, in your hair, in your nails. And that's what the farmers had to live with inside their homes and inside their farming lands. And it took years and years to wash that salt away. Then again, uh, this is another picture, again, aftermath of Isla, and you can see this woman, she's uh, uh, taken a bag of relief and she's walking back, but you can see the extensive damage to the embankment which actually protects uh, the farming lands. This picture, it's, uh, the arrow actually shows the path of Siddur, which actually happened two years earlier in 2007. And uh, if you look closely, the path is actually in the most heavily populated areas. And you can actually see Dhaka there. And so it missed Dhaka just by a few miles. So the next target could be you. And uh, Sidra caused actually millions of dollars in, in losses and lives also. About a million people were displaced. So another uh, evidence that uh, our delta is sinking and seawater is rising is this picture, which actually shows that the southwest of Bangla, uh, Bangladesh is actually sinking about nine millimeters per year in the southwest and about two millimeters per year uh, in the southeast. And this data was actually taken by a study of ancient temples and how they're actually going, you know, they're sinking or the sea level, sea level is rising. Climate change is actually, it's much worse if we have a large population. We heard the benefits of population this morning, but if we have many mouths to feed, uh, it's again pressure on arable land, and we have very little of land in Bangladesh. So this uh, slide actually shows, ever since man inhabited Earth, about two to five million years ago, and until the industrial and the technological uh, revolution, the, the population of human mankind was steady. But after this technological and industrial revolution, there was a staggering increase in population. And this staggering increase, it obviously put an enormous pressure on arable land, on crop production, uh, and other resources. And this is actually uh, imbalancing or disturbing the ecological balance of the earth. And unfortunately, Bangladesh is one of the densest populations in the whole world. As you can see, the densest is the darkest here. So we have to deal with it. So on the left, we can see a farmer's land with visible salt in the dry season. And of course, this land is producing too meager food and the hands that, you know, too many hands, a piece of bread. So what is the extent of this salinity because of seawater inundation and sea level rise? It's about a million hectares of coastal soil. It is affected by salinity. But this is, of course, in the dry season, in the monsoon. Actually, luckily, we Bangladeshis are very lucky that the major rivers actually wash the salt away. But during the dry season, this is the, this is the picture. And this area, so farmers actually grow just one crop there. But if there was less salinity, maybe they could grow another crop. So, and this one million hectares is actually a ninth of the total cultivable area of Bangladesh. So uh, to see what the salinity picture is like, the southwest is most affected. And as you can see, the orange part, the dark orange part, that's Shatkira, the Sundarbans. And as you go above, you can see, so even up to Jashore, the salinity level is rising and it's, it's, it's a gradual increase. So as the seabed, it's seeping inside of Bangladesh, but towards the East, the salinity problem is not, not that much, except for the tips. But the problem is that the salinity le level is rising gradually. Okay, so, and then temperature increase actually exacerbates this salinity problem. How does it do that? So let's look at this picture a little bit. So there's an average, so this is the trend from 1960 to 2014 in degrees Fahrenheit. 
But if you notice that the Northern Hemisphere, the temperature rises much more, and we are, of course, in the Northern Hemisphere. So when, we, when Paris climate change says that we want to keep the average temperature rise up to two, two degrees C, it actually means it's the average temperature. So in the Northern Hemisphere, that's going to be even more, even with two degrees C rise. So we have to keep that in mind. And so what happens is, you know, uh, we all know that 75% of the Earth is actually C. And if the temperature rises, uh, there's an expansion in the level of seawater, so that causes sea level rise. And then again, when uh, due to the higher temperature, the, we all know that you know the uh, the, uh, the ice is all melting in the northern hemisphere. So this further melting, it, it's actually causing uh, sea level rise. So it's two ways: the temperature increases the volume, and then again the ice melting is again uh, creating this. Uh, so in the next 50 years two degrees rise in the temperature and a resulting 0.5 meters rise in the sea level actually, which is quite a lot for Bangladesh. Why? Because as Bangladesh is a delta region and most of the whole area of Bangladesh is actually only one to five meters above sea level. And of course, storm surges are much higher. So coming to rice, so we need rice because we are a rice eating a, a country even if we diversify, we still, you know, rice will still remain our staple food for a long time to come. And if you can see, if you can note the lines here, currently in the dry season, this blue line, in the dry season, right below this blue line, rice doesn't grow in the dry season. And in the next 50 years, in the best case scenario, rice will not grow under the, the, green, uh, the green line which means another 10% of land will be lost to salinity. And in the worst case scenario, this, the rice will not grow under the red lines, which is another 20% of our arable land. So we started with one ninth affected, so uh, it's going to be even more. By 2050, a median rise of 26% is projected. However, in parts, there will be as much as a 55% increase in salinity in certain pockets. So, and rice will decline by 15.6% uh, in the nine coastal opazillas uh, because of exceeding soil salinity. And at the same time, the population will rise from 160 to 214 million by 2050. So we have to keep that in mind too. Rice is unfortunately a soil sensitive crop so how do, we, how do we deal with this problem? Rice has two stages, the baby stage in which it is most sensitive and uh, the maturity stage or the stage at which it sets gray, actually the flowering stage, when it's extreme, even more sensitive than the baby stage. So these are the two stages we target for tolerance when we do our work. Uh, this is how uh, rice will look like in a field which is affected by salinity in the coastal areas. So what's the answer? Again, we have to go uh, to nature. We heard about how we need to preserve nature. We do really need to preserve nature because nature has its own resources. And we have to look for those resources to find these genes or traits for salt tolerance. So we have these traditional varieties which have evolved in the coastal areas uh, and evolved over many years of you know, being exposed to salinity. And they provide an evolving pool of traits that can be tapped for salinity tolerance. And these have great biodiversity. They have great, so we have to preserve biodiversity. We have to do conservation for these. So in the biodiversity, depending on the local locality in which they are growing, they will have traits adapted to that particular region. It could be a toxic soil. It could be soil which is deficient of some, some things. So those rice will have adapted to that particular region. So if we, have to, if we want to use these traditional land races, as we call them, these evolving traditional, we call them land races, if we need, uh, we need to understand them a little bit more. So. The characteristics of a traditional uh, land race is it, it's okay, so in the coastal area, if you have a land race, it's going to be tolerant. However, it does not set enough grains to feed our population. All right, so it's just adapted for salt tolerance. So if I was to find an analogy for an athlete to perform well, he has to train his muscles, okay? He has to tone his muscles, he has to exercise, he or she. 
But in this case, these plants are not. They are just adapted to that particular trait. As, uh, and in this case, I'm talking about, uh, whereas commercial varieties, they have been bred by breeders to be high yielders only. So all, they are designed to have all the sun's energy go into grains. Okay, so uh, this is actually a paradox. So uh, however, these high yielding varieties, as we call them, they are very sensitive to any type of stress. It could be temperature, it could be salt, it could be anything. Okay, so what the, what's the difference? How do they look like when there's no salt? When those, there's no stress, this is what the plants look like. So here, the traditional land race, it's very leafy. All you can see is leaves, you can hardly see the grains. But, uh, on the other hand, the, the high yielding variety, this is what it looks like without salt. But see what happens when there's salt in the system. The high yielding variety will not be able to set any grain because it cannot tolerate stress. On the other hand, the traditional variety, it will not set higher level of grains, but it will set grains. And you know, you need grains to feed your population. So it can fight stress and it will give you grains, but it will not never, I mean, it doesn't give you high yields. So that's the, that's the, that's the problem. So, so now how, how can we solve this problem? So we actually need to put these salinity tolerance traits into the background of high yielding varieties so that we can et, end up with a high yielding salt tolerant plant. So how to do that? So we have some, so uh, breeders have been trying to breed the, in the traditional way by crossing. But it, it's, it has gives, given some success, but we need more, and we need it more rapidly. The other ways is we have the molecular tools now to identify the regions in uh, the traditional variety which are actually responsible for this tolerant trait that they have. So we identify them using molecular tools, and then we, we can do something which is called precision breeding so that only those loci go into the background of the high yielders. So that's, that's another thing, and we use DNA markers to do that. Uh, and the, the third approach is we can actually identify genes which help in salt tolerance. There are some genes which can actually take salt out of your cell. So we can identify those genes and try to put them in the background of commercial line. And the other thing is, I have used the word regulatory genes. So these are kind of master regulators which control downstream more genes. So it's better if you have, if you can, you know, uh, transform a, a master regulator, you, you see better results. From nature, I talked about a traditional variety, but nature has more resources. And these are, so on the left, this is what I was talking about. Uh, I won't talk about the terminology glyph glycophyte. So these are the coastal land races that I was talking about, uh, which, we, which can be used to introduce uh, salt tolerance into high yielders. But then we have, so these are adapted varieties, adapted to the local situation. But here we have, like, uh, it's called Poteracea coactata. Uh, I'll give you the local name in the next slide. Or we have the mangroves. Everybody knows that, you know, mangroves grow well in, in the coastal areas. So these halophytes are actually salt-loving. And uh, this is our own very much uridhan, we call it. I mean, the farmers call it uridhan. And it extends, it grows all over the coast of Bangladesh, right from Cox's Bazaar to Shatkira. And it's, it looks like a grass. This is actually Poteriosa coactata. And it, as you can see, it's actually setting some, a few grains. And this is a high yielding variety. So I just brought them to, to see what it looks like. And this Uri Dhan, it actually has salt glands, but it cannot be crossed. It cannot be crossed with rice because it's too distant. So it would be the equivalent of cross, crossing a ta cat with a tiger. We can't do that. So what can we do instead? Maybe we, the, there's a certain transporter proteins by which it can take the salt out of a cell because salt is toxic to the cell's metabolism. Could we clone these into commercial rice? So that's what we can attempt. And South India, some people have taken anti-toxicity gene from mangroves and introduced it into rice, and it grows into kind of one-sixth of seawater. So not full seawater, but one-sixth. And then we have the CRISPR technology in which we can actually choose non-GM crops. If you're afraid of non-GM crops, we can actually use CRISPR technology to edit the gene according to the information we have, but then select for a non-GM crop. And this has actually been done for blast resistance uh, in rice. So uh, they use CRISPR. And on the left, the wild type is the, the sensitive to rice blast. And the, on the right, you have the uh, resistant, uh, which was edited to CRISPR. This slide shows uh, 
one of the solutions that we are working with, uh, so it's transgenic rice at Dhaka University, and at the baby stage, you can see the left panel, the left rice, that's the, uh, the wild type. This is the wild type. And these are the transgenic lines. So these were uh, kind of exposed to, sell, uh, to salt for about 20 days. And you can see, so there was a, we put the P helicase gene, the Motoshuti, uh, the P, we took it and put this into the transgenic rice. And the same rice at reproductive stage, it is setting three times as much grain as uh, the wild type or the non-transgenic type. And this rice is actually, it's being, because it's transgenic rice, it has to go through a lot of regulation. It's being tested in contained trials at the transgenic greenhouse uh, at Bangladesh Rice Research Institute. So to conclude, farmers do not have a control over sea sea level rise or inundation in their farmer's fields, but nature has a solution. So what is the solution? We can have land races and do precision breeding or we can have the uridhan or the halophytes, and we, we can take useful genes and put them into high, salt tolerant, high yielding rice, which, which can grow near the salty fields. Thank you.